Lord, you are beautiful. Lord, it is our privilege to gather here together and worship you, to come together as your body and feel your presence among us. Hi, I'm John. Um, I'm a member here at the sanctuary. I am also a missionary with a group called Imago Christi. My wife and I were partners in life and partners in ministry. Uh, We are a group of uh, missionaries who enter into the contemplative life, do soul care, but also come together in multiple layers of community. As prayer partners, as a community, we come together three times a year for a week. Uh, but also on a weekly basis, we get involved in local communities like the sanctuary uh, as well as family. So there's, we all need multiple layers of community in our life. Some are formal, some are informal. Community, the space between us. There's a quote from Henry Nouwen. Community is not an institution forcing us to follow rules, but a community inviting us to still our hunger and thirst at the table. I love that. I would like for you to relax and view some snapshots of communities at various levels of connection, from imaginary community to vast communities of people serving us, people we're likely to never meet, to local communities, to communities of friends. Notice what you find yourself paying attention to, In what ways has your hunger and thirst been filled? In what ways is it still longing for something more? Community is essential to beings who are created for connection. Community spans the entire range of our personhood, our bodies, minds, souls, and spirits. As we connect with the world beyond us, from sharing pain to sharing joy, from sharing tears to sharing laughter, from sharing wisdom to sharing a dad joke. From playing to working, from vacation to mission, from silliness to seriousness, from sharing a burger to sharing communion. There is no dividing line between the secular and the sacred. All things, all of life, were created by him and for him. Community is something we naturally do as humans. Real connection is one of our deepest needs. Binge watching shows like Friends Cheers in the Office are good for a laugh, but community with flesh and blood people at all, levels of, at all levels of life is vital for human flourishing. Take a moment and think of one time of connection with another person. It could be small or it could be significant. Perhaps it was a kind word, a warm greeting, a hug, or a smile from someone familiar or perhaps someone unexpected. So why don't you close your eyes and actually do this. Think of, think of one encounter you've had with somebody. Could be recent, could be in the past. Sit in that memory. Sink into it. What are you feeling?
quietly express your gratitude to God for this small gift of community. How does the Lord respond to your gratitude? Thank you, Lord. There have been times when we have pulled our chairs up to the table of community and have found it so nourishing. But there are also times when we have longed for more. There is a deeper layer of community, we'll call it spiritual community, that is vitally essential for beings created in the image and likeness of God. Without this inner core of spiritual community, our hearts have difficulty filling and ever seldom feel full. Without the inner core of spiritual community, our hearts never connect at the deepest level, leaving empty space within us and between us. Without the inner core of our spiritual community, our flesh, the false self with all its conscious programs for security, esteem, and power, controls and takes and corrupts our connection to community from within. Lacking a true spiritual center, my false self looks to build community with the false self of others. Layers upon layers of false selves joining together to form a worldwide collective of soulless, unstoppable force, assimilating every soul at every level of community in the world, enslaving them and mining them dry of life-giving connection. In the New Testament, this malevolent, enslaved community of our false selves is called the world. Let's turn to the words of Jesus in John 17, verses 13 and 14. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus' joy filling us. That's really good news for hearts that have been emptied by the world. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The world hates those who will not walk in its ways. We should expect no less than hatred and scorn when we choose to walk in love and forgiveness instead of fear and aggression. Continuing in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The only thing worse than being in the world and not of it is to be in the world and of it. The world may hate us for following Christ, but it is hell on earth for those it transforms into its own image and likeness. The Lord fills the outer darkness between us to deliver us from the evil one. Community, the space between us. In the fall of 2002, after 22 years of marriage, I was living in the broken life of the very recently divorced, just trying to survive the darkest six months of my life after the worst five years of my life. We had moved to Colorado in 2001, and I had not yet made any real connections outside of the pastor at the new church I was attending. In shame and failure, I had self-isolated and did not have the capacity to make new connections and friendships when I was in this broken state. At the beginning of the Anglican liturgy, we're doing the perfunctory shake hands and greet. Hi, my name is John, welcome, blah, 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 easy peasy. Let's blow past the shallow socializing and get on to communion and worship so I can find some meaningful connection with God because I'm running on spiritual fumes. I was shaking hands with a stranger, some guy in his mid-40s, probably a contractor, judging by the strength of the grip and the roughness of his hands. 
He was pretty tough, pretty buff, cut, looked like a cage fighter. Here we are, two strangers shaking hands in church, and he stops, looks me intently in the eyes and says, you're really hurting, aren't you? And he pulled me in for a hug. I don't know who started weeping first, but we just stood there hugging and weeping. I don't know for how long we had stepped into God's presence, God's time, oblivious to all but the Lord sharing our pain. No platitudes, no judgment, no fixing, no advice, just seeing, being present, and sharing the presence of Christ in the space between us. I can still feel the Lord embracing me and weeping with me, sanctifying me with truth too deep for words, reminding me that he sees me, reminding me that I am the beloved of God. I don't remember his name. Maybe I should just call him Jesus. John 17, verse 17 through 19. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Lord consecrates himself to be a life-giving spirit who fills the space between us that we might abide in the love of the Father. He sanctifies us in his truth cleansing us, reminding us who we are, filling us with the love of God. You are the beloved. I see you. I weep with you. From this place of abiding in his love, he sends us into the world to proclaim his truth, the half-filled hearts, struggling to survive as they are being ground up in the gears of a world that is mining their souls dry. Son of man, Can these dry bones live? Be sanctified with this truth. Let it soak into your empty hearts and dried bones. Let it become our truth so that his joy may fill our hearts, a spring of living water that never runs dry. In John 17, 22, Jesus is praying these words to the Father. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. That they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me, Jesus. The heavenly man, the life-giving spirit, the true image of the, the invisible God, the word of God, by whom, in whom, and for whom all things were created, one with the Father, And he shares his glory with us so that we can be drawn into his union with the Father. The Father, Son, and Spirit are one. To see Jesus, to hear Jesus, is to see and hear the Father. Jesus only did and spoke what he saw the Father doing and heard the Father speaking. What is spiritual community? Spiritual community is sharing in the union of Jesus with the Father by the Holy Spirit and us all being made one, just as they are one. This is Jesus' prayer. This is Jesus' desire for us. As people made in the image and likeness of God, community is something essential to who we were designed to be. We cannot flourish without community. We We quickly deteriorate and suffer without a high degree of interconnectivity through all the dimensions of our personhood, materially, emotionally, socially, spiritually. The Spirit of Christ fills the space of interconnectivity within us and between us. Christian community is where we participate in the presence of Christ among us, where he fills the space between us and makes us one body, his body. Community is vital, but is it the only thing? What about solitude and mission? How do they all fit together? Henry Nouwen gives us a teaching from the Gospel of Luke 
uh, verses 6, 12 to 6. This has an impact at our community, Imago Christi, and many, many other community, communities and how Jesus approached community. In Luke 6, 12 to 19, we're going to see, we're going to talk from there about Jesus' pattern of community, which was solitude, community, and ministry. I'm going to summarize that passage for you. Jesus went up. These are the words of Henry Nouwen. Jesus went up to the mountain to pray at night. He went up to abide in communion with his father in solitude. In the morning, he came down the mountain, gathered his disciples to himself, called his 12 apostles, apostles around him. In the afternoon, he went out on the plain and then t- went out on the plain with them to preach the good news and heal the sick. He had communion with his father first, then he had community, and then he went out to do the work of God. That is the order of things. That is Jesus' order of how he lived his life. As disciples of Jesus, we would be wise to make it our order of living, abiding with God in solitude, then gathering in community, and from community being sent out in ministry, solitude, community, ministry. Let's address these in order. Solitude. Abiding in solitude with the presence of God is the foundation for all being and doing. This is reflected in the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Unless we are rooted and grounded in love, everything that flows out of us will be driven by the flesh, the false self. Apart from abiding in the Lord, we can do nothing. Being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, in one spirit, we behold the Father and become filled with the one whom we behold. We carry the fullness of God we received in the solitude of communion into community. Community. God creates spiritual community to become one with his own Trinitarian union. We do not speak spiritual community as a means to achieve some other goal than to abide in the love of God. As Tim Keller says, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. There is no greater end than Jesus that we come to Jesus for, but Jesus himself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all those other good and necessary things will be added to you. But seek God first. We don't look for perfect communities because they don't exist. But we ask God to lead us and join a community that is a work in progress. Dietrich Bonhoeffer cautions us. The person who's in love with their vision of community will destroy community. But the person who loves people around them will create community everywhere they go. The father led Jesus to select Judas, the one who would betray him as one of the 12. As Henry Nouwen liked to say, there was always a discordant note in community, someone you would not choose, but God deems as good and necessary for his work in us. In the flesh, we would choose another community or we would cast the fellow out. But Jesus, the heavenly man, shares his table, his trust, and his life with his betrayer. In community, there is always that person in whom you do not experience the sweetness of Christ, but some really rotten fruit. Maybe for someone you're that person. What is lacking in community always drives us back to communion with God in solitude. Only God can fill our need for perfect, unconditional love. Henry Nouwen cautions us, Never expect from community what only God can give. Ministry. In ministry, Jesus never sent the disciples out alone, but he sent them in smaller communities of two. 
Why do you think he did that? Because we need communities. Without community, even one as small as two, we are easily pulled back into the world that is at enmity with the spirit of Christ within us. In the spiritual community of pairs, we experience the presence of Christ in ourselves, in each other, and in the space between us. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Matthew 18, 20. It is the pattern, the rhythm, the order, solitude, community, ministry. In solitude, we abide in deep communion with the Father. In community, we gather together in Jesus' name and experience him among us. And in ministry, we are sent out together with Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as our soul is transformed by the Spirit, abiding in our spirit, in the center of our being, the Spirit abiding in spiritual community fills the space between us with the love and presence of God, flowing outward and transforming all the other communities in which we live, work, and play. The substance of the spiritual community is the Holy Spirit, Christ in us, the Father in Christ, Christ the heavenly man, the life-giving spirit, one body, one spirit, one Lord of all, the Father through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is drawing us into the very nature of God. So how do we actually do spiritual community? We take the same principles of abiding in communion with the Lord in solitude and apply them to abiding in communion with the Lord within community. Before we come together, we are rooted and grounded in God's love for us. We love because he first loved us. We behold God, loving the loving one, and become like the one whom we behold. We become vessels filled with love. We are drawn together out of a fullness of his loving desire to make us one in him. Just as we are drawn into his presence within us in solitude, so too are we drawn to his presence among us in community. We begin to behold Christ in one another. We bless and sanctify one another by speaking the truth of who they are in Christ. In the love of Christ, our motives are being transformed. We grow from our needs needing to be filled in community to, becoming, to come with the expectancy of a cheerful giver, motivated, motivated, motivated by him, Motivate, motivated by his love working in, with, and through us far beyond our own capacity. We come to behold one another in Christ. We come to give the gift of being present, of seeing one another, not fixing one another, not judging, not lecturing, the gift of presence, making space to behold the pain of another and weeping with them, making space to behold their joy, and celebrating with them and giving blessing in his name. Bless. Sometimes we get to be Jesus to others. Through the miraculous presence of Christ in the space between us, we see through his eyes, touch with his hands, speak truth to one another with his compassion, his love, his authority. We call this blessing. Getting past ourselves, our false self with all its insecurities, vulnerabilities, and fear of not being enough is hard. That's why we need to abide in the Lord in solitude. You never know when Jesus might want to step into the space between us. Be filled with his love. Be ready to enter into the flow of his presence and give blessing. Judith Haugen, in Transformed into Fire, says this about blessing. When we bless people, we are, not sitting, we are not simply patting them on the back and saying and praising them for a job well done. This is simply praise. Praise is good, but to bless is something more. To bless people is to remind them through our words and actions of who they really are. To recognize they are they are the image of God, created in the image of God, and to speak what is eternally true about them. 
To bless is to connect others to God and to their true selves in Christ. Henry Nouwen adds, to give blessing is to affirm, to say yes to a person's belovedness. And more than that, to give blessing creates the, the reality into which it speaks. There is creative power when God speaks blessing through us. Haugen retells a story given by Henry Nouwen in Life of the Beloved where Nowen, who spent the last five years of his life pastoring a community for the developmentally disabled people in Toronto, came to understand the depth of our human hunger for blessing. Not long ago in my own community, I had a very personal experience of the power of real blessing. Shortly before I started prayer service in one of our houses, Janet, a handicapped member of our community, said to me, Henry, can you give me a blessing? I responded with the somewhat automatic way by tracing my thumb in the sign of the cross on her forehead. No, that doesn't work, she protested. I want a real blessing. I suddenly became aware of the ritualistic quality of my response to her request and I said, I'm sorry, let me give you a real blessing when we are all together for the prayer service. She nodded with a smile and I realized that something special was required of me after the service, when about 30 people were sitting in a circle on the floor, I said, Janet has asked for a special blessing. She feels that she needs that now. As I was saying this, I didn't know what Janet really wanted, but Janet seemed to leave no doubt in my mind for very long. As soon as I said, Janet has asked for a special blessing, she stood up and walked toward me. I was wearing a long white robe with ample sleeves that covering my hands as well as my arms. Spontaneously, Janet put her arms around me and put her head against my chest. Without thinking, I covered her with my sleeves so that she almost vanished in the folds of my robe and we held each other. I said, Janet, I want you to know that you are God's beloved daughter. You are precious in his eyes your beautiful smile, your kindness to the people in our, your house, and all the good things do show you are a beautiful, and all the good things you do show what a beautiful human being you are. I know you feel a little low these days, and there is some sadness in your heart, but I want you to remember who you are, a very special person, deeply loved by God and by all the people who are here with you. As I said these words, Janet raised her head and looked at me and her broad smile showed me that she had really heard and received the blessing. When she returned to her place, Jane, another handicapped woman, raised her hand and said, I want a blessing too. She stood up and before I knew it, I put, had put her face against my chest. After I had spoken words of blessing to her, many more of the handicapped people followed, expressing the same desire to be blessed. The most touching moment, however, came when one of the assistants, a 24-year-old student, raised his hand and said, what about me? Sure, I said, come. He came, and as we stood before each other, I put my arms around him and said, John, it is good for you, it is good that you are here, you are God's beloved son. Your presence is a joy for all of us. When things are hard and life is burdensome, always remember that you are loved with an everlasting love. As I spoke these words, he looked into my eyes with tears and he said, thank you. Thank you very much. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Ordinary acts made extraordinary by Jesus filling the space between us with real blessing. The Polish artic, artist Leszek Forsek captures this beautifully in this painting of the washing of feet, transforming an everyday menial, menial task into the divine space of Christ between us. Blessing is not for a select few. 
Blessing is for those familiar with the sacred touch of God. And with God, touch what is sacred within the other. In community, we make space between us for Jesus to give real blessing in us, with us, and through us. We make space for vulnerability. We make vulnerable space to see and be seen. We speak blessing into the space between us and our children, between us and our spouse, between us and our coworkers, between us and our friends, between us and the divine encounter with a stranger. We make space in which to ask deeper questions. How was your soul? Where did you experience God's love today? Where did you experience joy, wonder? Where did you experience pain? Community, the space between us that Jesus fills. Let us fill the space between us with the grace needed to practice spiritual community, the grace needed to learn any new skill. The new is always awkward, especially the language of love. Give the grace to yourself and to others to practice, to fail, to learn from failure, and try again and again until loving naturally flows and we begin creating unexpected moments of community everywhere we go, even with strangers. Well, that sounds like mission. Could evangelism be as simple as two Christians so practicing community, creating so practice in making space between them for spiritual community in whatever they're doing. Working, bicycling, golfing, having a beer, throwing a frisbee. That an, an acquaintance, that when an acquaintance is invited to join the party, they experience the authentic love and blessedness of God. Could evangelism be that simple? Make space between us for Jesus to do Jesus. Our spirits hunger and thirst for the deep waters of God's presence among us. In community, we make space for that. We hunger and thirst for people who know us by name, who can share our pain and weep with us. In community, we make space for that. We hunger and thirst for people with whom we can play, laugh, and have fun. In community, we make space for that. We hunger and thirst for people with whom we can watch a ball game or a concert. In community, we make space for that. We hunger and thirst for people whom we can kick back and party at the lake. In community, we make space for that. It was while they were feasting, while they were still eating, making space for conversation, in ordinary community that Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. In like manner, he took the cup. Gave thanks and said, take this and drink it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant. Do this. Remember me. I am here among you. Make space to see me in the souls of the person gathered at your table. And I will, spirit, and I will fill the space between you. For those of you who are near to the Lord, come. The Lord desires to fill the space between us. For those of you who are far from the Lord, come. The Lord desires to fill the space between us. For those of you hungering for deep waters, come. The Lord desires to fill the space between us. For those of you hungering for an afternoon of fun at the lake, come. The Lord desires to fill the space between us. He is among us in all things filling our joys, filling our tears, 
filling our worship, filling our silence. Jesus is filling the space between us with his presence. Come. So as we go today, I want to proclaim this blessing over you, and I want you to receive it, that you are the body of Christ, energized and animated by his spirit. You are the beloved son and daughter of Christ. And through all of our differences, through all of our diversity, he has drawn us together and unified us to himself. Go in his peace and unity today. Amen. Mm -hmm.